everyone, my name is Valerie and I'm the Outreach Coordinator of Future Energy Systems, or FEZ. FEZ is a research program at the University of Alberta focused on studying the energy transition. Thanks so much for joining us for Let's Understand Energy and the Economy. In this series of clips, you'll meet four researchers studying different aspects of the economics questions surrounding energy, from the cost of energy in the Northwest Territories, to getting biojet off the ground, to use of tax refund policies to encourage habitat restoration, to life cycle analysis of land reclamation technologies. In this first part, meet Abumanu Jamwal, a former master's student who looked at the cost of energy in the Northwest Territories, from the causes of the high cost, to challenges in reducing it, to the role of alternative energy sources and more. Hello everyone, I'm Abhimanyu Jamwal. I graduated from the University of Alberta in 2020 with a Master of Science degree in Urban and Regional Planning. My research studied the relationship between the cost of energy and homelessness in the Northwest Territories. I wanted to know if the cost of energy was high in the Northwest Territory, and if yes, what were the reasons for it? I also looked at the challenges in reducing the cost of energy and explored what efforts have been made in reducing the cost of energy. So picture an area with a harsh climate where severe and long winters make it hard for plants to grow an area where resources to produce energy is scarce and hard to use. Yes, you guessed it. I am talking about the Canadian North, and in this case, the Northwest Territories. The Northwest Territories has a population of more than 44,000 people, and one of the problems residents have been facing is the cost of energy. On an average, a resident in the Northwest Territory pays $387 per month for 1,000 kilowatt of energy. In Alberta, an average resident pays 97% less per kilowatt hour for electricity compared to a resident in the Northwest Territories. So why energy is so expensive? First reason is the transportation. In the Northwest Territory, around 57% of electricity is produced by burning diesel. But the diesel has to be transported by train from Alberta to the Southern Northwest Territories. However, many communities in the Northwest Territories are very small and far from each other, only accessible by rivers or ice roads. When diesel from Alberta is unloaded at Southern Northwest Territory, it is either transported to isolated communities through barges or to landlocked communities by ice roads. Due to a climate change, the roads are accessible for a short period and sometimes roads are not able to bear the fully loaded trucks meaning more trips are needed with half-loaded trucks. All these transportation costs increases the cost of diesel, which is already changes a lot. The other reason for the high energy cost is the lack of economies of scale. An economy of scale means that when we produce more, we can usually produce it cheaper. However, in the North, whether a lot or a little electricity is produced by a diesel generator, the amount of skilled workforce required is the same. Therefore, it is hard to achieve the economy of scale, adding to the cost of the energy. Moreover, these skilled workforces are paid higher salaries, which adds to the cost of energy. So can we reduce the cost of energy in the Northwest Territory? Well, there are a lot of challenges. One of the critical challenges is that the Northwest Territory doesn't have the intergrade connectivity. Intergrid connectivity means a community X and community Z are connected to each other with high voltage power lines or wires. In that case, communities are able to transfer extra electricity to each other in times of need. Without intergrid connectivity, communities with access to cheap and extra electricity cannot share electricity with communities dependent on expensive source of electricity. So why can't we connect the communities together with a grid? The reason is the remoteness of communities, which increases the cost of doing work or business. In this case, supplying the energy from energy facilities to the homes. Additionally, the Northwest Territories has no connection with the North American power grid. So they 
can't sell the extra energy or access the cheaper energy from the grid. So what are the options? The Northwest Territory has a long and sunny days in summer. So can we use the solar panel to produce electricity? Well, there are challenges for solar energy as well. First, it can only be used in summers because winters are dark and daytime is limited. Second, to store the extra energy in summers, you will need batteries and that adds to the cost of the project. Hydroelectricity, wind, solar and biomass heating are the current alternative sources of energy used in the Northwest Territories. Hydroelectricity contributes around 37% of total electricity generated in the Northwest Territory. Yellowknife is one of the few communities that is dependent on hydroelectricity. And if the expansion of Talson Hydro Project takes place, the cost of energy will reduce. Apart from hydro, there is solar energy as discussed above, which is highly subsidized by the territorial government, which means they help pay for it. There are few communities in the Northwest Territory, such as Colville Lake and Fort Simpson, who have installed solar facilities. In Colville Lake, solar panels are installed along with the batteries, which can meet up to 30% demand of the communities. However, solar contributes less than 1% of the total electricity generated across the entire Northwest Territory. Wind energy contributes around 2% of the total electricity produced in the Northwest Territories, and the private sectors such as diamond mines are the major consumer of the wind energy as it's mostly installed and operated by the private sector. However, wind and solar at present comes at a higher cost to most of the communities in territories when compared to diesel, and they are not considered a total solution for the energy problems of communities because they are intermittent source of energy, meaning they are not there all the time. The biomass heating is another alternative used in the Northwest Territories at the local level, and it is used as a substitute for oil-fired heating. Biomass heating is a process in which the wood pellets are burned to produce heat for space heating and hot water. The biomass heating system can help to save around 30 to 50% of cost compared to oil furnaces. However, biomass is not used for electricity production because a significant amount of energy is lost when converting it into electricity. Biomass generation is more expensive than diesel or liquefied natural gas generation, but, it is, but its environmental, economic, and social benefit overwhelms the operational cost. So I have discussed the reason for the high cost of energy, challenges with diesel and other alternative energy sources in providing the low cost electricity in the Northwest Territory. However, efforts are being made by the territorial government to reduce the cost of electricity, but more work is needed to explore ways to reduce the cost of electricity. Here we have Megan Lim, a student working in biofuels. Here they'll share their work working on biojet, a special kind of biofuel used for flying, and discuss its potential and reasons for its current low production. Hi there, my name is Megan and I'm a student studying conservation biology as well as environmental economics and policy. I've been living in Edmonton for the last four years, but I'm currently on exchange in New Zealand finishing off my degree. As part of the Alberta Biojet Initiative, I've been working with lead researcher Marty Lukert and his team to study Biojet. So today, I'm going to be introducing you to Biojet, what it is, why we want to make it, and why not much of it is currently being made. The team I'm working with is an environmental economics group that studies biofuels at the University of Alberta. Biofuels are liquid fuels that are made from living plant matter called feedstock. While almost any biological material can be used as feedstock, common feedstocks include agricultural crops like soybean oil or sugarcane, leftover plant material like corn leaves and stalks, and waste oils like used french fry oil. Biofuels are designed to replace fossil fuels such as gasoline and diesel, but my research has focused on a special type of biofuel that is made to power airplanes. 
This type of biofuel is known as biojet. Unlike biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel, which have been used to power cars for well over 50 years, biojet was only invented around 20 years ago. This is because jet fuels must be made to withstand the extreme conditions airplanes fly through, and it's harder to make a biofuel that can do this. But why did we want to start making plant-based plane fuel anyway? Over the past year, I attempted to answer this question by reading over 200 publications that discussed biojet, writing down the reasons they listed, and ranking those reasons based on the number of times they were mentioned in the literature. Ultimately, I discovered that there are over 20 of these opportunities for biojet production, but here are the top three. The number one opportunity is the increasing demand for jet fuel. This demand likely results from recent increases in wealth in developing countries, which mean that more of their citizens are flying more often. More demand for jet fuel means a greater opportunity for biojet producers to sell their product. But from an environmental perspective, this increase in air traffic also means an increase in greenhouse gas emissions, which are released when jet fuel is burned in an airplane's engine. These greenhouse gases contribute to global warming, which has negative impacts on the environment and society. But unlike traditional fossil jet fuel, which is made from crude oil, biojet is made from plants that absorb greenhouse gases as they grow. This means that the emissions released by a biojet-powered airplane are balanced out, or offset, by the growth of the biojet's feedstock. In this way, the production and use of biojet can result in far fewer emissions than the production and use of fossil jet fuel. Ultimately, this means that if airplanes are powered by biojet, more flights don't necessarily mean more emissions. The second reason is that biojet is currently the most feasible replacement for jet fuel. While it may also be possible to power planes on electricity or hydrogen fuel, these options pose many technological challenges and would require entirely new, expensive aircraft and infrastructure. On the other hand, biojet is convenient because it can be used in existing aircraft. The third opportunity is supportive government policy. This includes carbon pricing mechanisms, like the European Union's emissions trading system. Policies like this encourage biojet use by requiring carbon emitters to pay for the greenhouse gases they create. By flying with biojet, aircraft operators pay less money to the government because they've reduced their greenhouse gas emissions. There are also policies called blending mandates, which require a certain proportion of all fuel sold to be biofuel. One well-known blending mandate is the United States Renewable Fuel Standard. In Canada, you might see the impacts of similar policies when you fill up your car with gasoline that contains 10% ethanol. But even though the vast majority of these blending mandates only require a certain proportion of ethanol or biodiesel, not biojet, many authors think that they may still benefit biojet producers since other types of biofuel are often made alongside biojet and since biojet may still receive credits or count towards the proportions set in the blending mandates. But despite these important opportunities, biojet currently accounts for less than 1% of the jet fuel being consumed every year. There are hardly any commercial biojet producers, and many companies either started producing biojet, then switched to other, more profitable products, or just haven't committed to building a full-size biojet plant in the first place. So why hasn't Biojet taken off? This was the second question I was hoping to address. So as I was reading all of those publications, I was also recording the reasons for Biojet's lack of success. I found that Biojet producers face over 40 different challenges, and here are the top three. As I'm sure you might have guessed, the biggest of those challenges is cost. Right now, it costs around two to four times more to produce biojet than it does to produce fossil jet fuel. This makes it really difficult for biojet producers to sell their premium priced product. The biggest contributor to this cost is often the cost of the feedstock. This is because in many cases, feedstocks like crop oils are already more expensive than fossil jet fuel. Another important cost is called the capital investment cost. This includes the price of the equipment needed to make the biojet which can be very expensive since some production methods rely on extremely high temperature and high pressure equipment. 
The second biggest challenge to producers is feedstock availability. Since most biofuels are made from crops and there is a limited amount of land and water to grow them on. For example, one author estimates that 12% of the Earth's cropland would need to be dedicated to feedstock production in order to satisfy the global demand for jet fuel. In addition, many other industries also require feedstock, such as the ethanol and biodiesel industries. Because these fuels are more profitable than biojet, their producers often use the majority of the feedstock, leaving very little feedstock for biojet. A third important challenge facing biojet producers is sustainability, since producers must make sure that they don't harm the environment or the people living in it while making biojet. For example, research shows that some types of biojet can actually create more greenhouse gas emissions than fossil jet fuel if forested areas must be cleared to grow its feedstock. In addition, using land to grow feedstock can reduce the amount of land available to grow food for communities. Even though the biojet industry faces significant challenges, there are dozens of multi-stakeholder groups working to find solutions. With a little luck and a lot of research, biojet may someday be used in every flight around the world. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed learning about biojet. I'd also like to give a special thanks to our sponsors who have supported the work we do through the Alberta Biojet Initiative. For more information on this project, you can contact Principal Investigator Marty Lukert at martylukert at ualberta.ca. He's a professor in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology in the Faculty of Agricultural, Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. You can also check out more future energy systems research on the website. Now we have Zhang Ji Zhang, a master's graduate whose research looked at the use of tax and tax refund policies to encourage oil and gas companies to restore caribou habitat. Boreal caribou herds in Alberta continue to be under pressure from human disturbances to their habitat more than five years after the development of federal threatened species recovery strategy. Land use by the energy sector, including the development of seismic lines like this, continued, uh, is largely responsible for the decline in terrible population in Alberta. Although oil sands firms are required to reclaim their land at, at the end of their project, the so-called legacy seismic lines still generate land damage during energy production. If we do not take effective measures to restore land early, caribou may disappear in the near future. To an economist, a tax could create an incentive to reclaim land early, but we understand nobody likes taxes. That is why we explore a tax refund scheme. Specifically, we investigate a policy that collects taxes from firms based on the land damage they impose, and then repay firms based on the land uh, energy output in the same period. Using the land use information and the data on in-situ oil sands firms, we construct a simulation model to assess the reclamation decisions, caribou population impacts, and economic outcomes on the three different cases. The current case, the tax case, and the tax refund case. If we maintain the current land use practice and take no other actions, there will be few caribou left in 30 years. If we levy taxes, the caribou population will theoretically increase because of reclamation, but the tax policy may not be politically feasible. If we levy taxes and then repay firms, we expect to get the same desirable caribou results with little adverse economic impact. So, the tax refund scheme, scheme could be used as a strategy for caribou recovery through habitat reclamation. It also provides insights about dealing with abandoned wells on private land and speeding up reclamation efforts for other renewable and non-renewable energy projects that have adverse land use impacts. Thanks. In this 
Today's final part, meet Maggie Cascadden, a PhD candidate who is using life cycle analysis to assess reclamation technologies developed by future energy systems researchers. By understanding all the inputs and outputs throughout the lifetime of these technologies, they can determine which ones are more suited for commercialization. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie Cascadden, and I'm excited to present our research team's project to you. Our project is a life cycle analysis of novel materials and processes, and it's about the process of sustainable innovation. We're from the business school, so this project brings a business lens to the cool emerging technologies that other researchers are developing within the Future Energy Systems Research Program. The Future Energy Systems Initiative is all about understanding, designing, and evolving our future energy system so it looks the way we want. An important part of this is innovating solutions to clean up what's going to be left behind by our current energy system. In truth, this is a very difficult task, otherwise we would have already done it. And part of the solution will have to include technologies that haven't yet been fully researched or developed. Our team is specifically looking at the cool technologies that are being developed for constructed wetlands designed to clean up oil, sands, process water. The first part of our study is to understand what energy, chemicals, and human power these technologies take to be manufactured and the kinds and quantity of pollution they create. To do this, we're conducting something called a life cycle analysis. This is a method of accounting for all the inputs and outputs of a product making process so you can add these up and see the full impact of that product on the environment. Inputs include things like water and energy, and outputs might include waste, uh, heat, and chemicals. This is what it looks like for one of the technologies biochar, and as you can see here, there are many steps and it's quite complicated. If you look at this other novel technology based on chicken feathers, it's even more complicated. The life cycle analysis software can generate estimates of material usage and waste products based on an inputted version of these maps. And it's important to conduct these kind of analyses so that we know the impacts of the technologies we're creating. That's our first major goal. After all, these technologies are not going to help us create the kind of future energy system we want if their production causes a worse environmental impact than what we're trying to clean up. In addition to all that, it's important that these technologies are economically viable if we want them to be real solutions that we can actually get out into the field and adopted by industry. So the second important part of our project is to identify which of these technologies have potential to be commercialized. Once we understand the life cycle of the new technologies, we can understand how much they're gonna cost to produce. Our goal for this project are threefold. First is to identify which technologies are gonna be the most beneficial for oil sands process water cleanup, Second is to identify which technologies are economically viable and commercializable. And ultimately, we want to help scientists and engineers who are working on the best technologies get their work out of the lab and into the field. Thank you. Thank you for joining us to start better understanding energy and the economy. Make sure to subscribe to Future Energy Systems YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our exciting content and check out the links below. There's so much to learn as we explore our energy future.